meeting, darling? I want a triple scotch. Oh, as bad as that. Why? <sighs> Apparently, the financial crisis is much worse than we thought. All the cabinet have got to make cuts in their spending plans. Bernard, would you like a scotch? Oh, yes, sir. Could I have a large one, please? Oh, another triple. <laughs> Bernard, Humphrey should have seen this coming and warned me. I don't think Sir Humphrey understands economics, Prime Minister. He did read classics, you know. <laughs> well, that's a friend. He's head of the Treasury. Well, I'm afraid he's at an even greater disadvantage in understanding economics. He's an economist. <laughs> if there's an economic crisis, can't the Cabinet see they've got to be cuts? Well, they can see they've got to be cuts in other departments, not in their own. So this morning you ordered a clamp down? I can't order anything, darling. I'm only the Prime Minister. <laughs> You're in charge. No, I'm not. A leader can only lead by consent. Consensus. That's democracy. So who is in charge if you're not? Well, nobody, really. Oh, that's <laughs> it must be. That's what democracy is all about. And as if that weren't enough, I've got a deputation of MPs coming to see me this afternoon about a pay rise I promised them. What will you say? I shall say I deeply sympathise, which I don't. They fully deserve their money, which isn't true. <laughs> And that I shall make it my first priority as soon as the crisis is over, which I shan't. But if they go and vote themselves a whacking great pay rise and then tell everybody else there's no money for their pay rises, it doesn't do very much for the dignity of Parliament, which it doesn't. But aren't they underpaid, in fact? Underpaid? Backbench MPs, darling. Being an MP is a vast, subsidised ego trip. It's a job for which you need no qualifications, there are no compulsory hours of work, no performance standards. You get a warm room and subsidised meals for a bunch of self-opinionated windbags and busybodies. You suddenly find people taking them seriously because they've got the letters MP after their name. How can they be underpaid when there are about 200 applicants for every vacancy? You could fill every seat 20 times over, even if they had to pay to do the job. But you were a backbench MP only five years ago. I was the exception. <laughs> I was the cream. I rose to the top. <laughs> Do you think what you say will shut them up? Oh, who knows? But the public will never stand for MPs giving themselves a pay rise when we're having to cut back on nurses and teachers. Nurses and teachers? Oh, that's a much more serious problem. Oh, no, darling, much less serious. Nurses and teachers can't vote against me till the next election. Backbenchers can vote against me at 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Humphrey, I've just had a very stormy meeting with my backbenchers. Oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, if I'd had some warning, I could have softened them up a bit in advance. But the paper only arrived the night before Cabinet. Oh, indeed, Prime Minister, most regrettable. Well, it's up to you, Humphrey. <laughs> Your Cabinet Secretary, you must insist that we get papers circulated earlier. Alas, there are grave problems about circulating papers before they're written. <laughs> Why the sudden crisis? The Treasury must have seen it coming. Prime Minister, I am not the permanent secretary to the Treasury. You must ask Sir Frank. What would Sir Frank say? It is not for a humble mortal such as I to speculate on the <laughs> complex and elevated deliberations of the mighty. But in general, I think Sir Frank believes that if the Treasury knows that something has to be done, the Cabinet shouldn't have too much time to think about it. <laughs> but that's an outrageous view. Yes, indeed. It's known as Treasury policy. <laughs> Suppose the Cabinet has questions. Well, I think Sir Frank's view is that um, on the rare occasions when the Treasury understands the questions, the Cabinet doesn't understand the answers. 